All right, you got the picture? Good. Everybody get back to work. A Black so. News Tonight exclusive. Last week, we covered how during a virtual talk at the Yale School of Medicine, Dr. Aruna Pilanani, who is a forensic psychiatrist and psychoanalyst, used language that some considered violent and hostile. Take a listen. And the fantasies of unloading a revolver into the head of any white person that got in my way, daring their body, and wiping my bloody hands as I walked away relatively guiltless. With a gun to my chest, like I did the world favor. After the speech, the Yale School of Medicine released a statement that said, we weighed our grave concern about the extreme hostility, imagery of violence and profanity expressed by the speaker against our commitment to freedom of expression. And they decided to make the talk what? available only. Y'all you, you, want to read that again? Because uh, I want to read that again. I don't know what the fuck um, you said. What? I just want y'all to... I have fantasies of unloading a revolver into the head of any white person. I got away. I don't want to read this. I feel like <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> I feel like, like I feel like somebody's going to mess up my audio and right. redo this. Yeah, like, I'm not reading it. Like, yeah. you can press play if you want. I'll read it then. Okay, that's true. I'm sure I'm, you will. Or I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying. No, this, so this is I'm what uh, forensic uh, psychiatrist, psychiatrist and psychoanalyst. What's her name? Aruna Kalinianani? Dr. Aruna Kalinianani. Her picture's on the screen. So this is what she said. I have fantasies of unloading a revolver into the head of any white person that got in my way, burying their in my way, burying their body. And wiping my bloody hands as I walked away relatively guiltless. With a bounce in my step, like I did a world a fuck a effing favor. Okay. That is pretty graphic, I, honestly. Okay, let's go. The Yale School of Medicine released a statement that said, We're watch this whole thing, we weighed this our is... grave concern about the extreme hostility, <laughs> imagery yeah. of violence, and profanity expressed by what the speaker against our commitment to freedom of expression. And they decided to make the talk available only to people who attended. Mind you, this is a medical school. Joining me now yeah. is forensic psychiatrist and psychoanalyst Dr. Aruna Kilanani. Thank you so much for joining me on Black News tonight. Hi. Thanks for having me here. Absolutely. Let's start with April 6th. You gave a mm -hmm. virtual talk uh, at Yale. Yeah. What was your intention? What was the premise of the, of the talk for you? So the intention is to actually talk about unconscious negative feelings. Because if we're not actually aware of unconscious negative feelings, it's going to turn into a violent action. And people who are actually can access and tolerate negative feelings are mentally healthier. So of course I don't wanna kill white people. <laughs> That's completely ludicrous. Um, but I think through my words, white people feel like they're actually getting murdered because my words are troubling. It's gonna cause the death of their preferred self image, their image that they've had through colonialism of being good, helping Just and wait. teaching. And as a psychoanalyst, I had a goal which is to access unconscious feelings around race. So my work is actually about accessing unconscious negative feelings and ideas in the unconscious. Um, so I was normalizing negative feelings, which is also what I do in my practice in psychoanalysis and psychotherapy. So I'm going to read this again. You said, I had fantasies of unloading a revolver into the head of any white person so I didn't have in my way, burying their body and wiping <laughs> bloody hands <laughs> as I walked away relatively guiltless with a bounce in my step like I did the world in effing favor. That type of feeling, what cre first of all, what creates that type of feeling uh, in a person of color toward white mm -hmm. people? And how yeah. common do you believe that feeling is? So the, fe the feeling of frustration and rage is actually very common. Uh, yes, and ta I'm talking about it sort of metaphorically about how difficult it is to actually have an honest, direct conversation with somebody on race because what you're coming up against is defenses. That's not happening, you're the problem, you're seeing things, and it's that level of frustration. So I'm talking metaphorically about the level of frustration and and I'm not speaking literally, but I am speaking about a futility, a feeling of futility about not being able to move further in a conversation. 
And I think that that feeling is very, is very common amongst people of color. Have you ever expressed that fantasy before in an academic setting or any other formal professional setting? Uh, no, but in not around race, but I think around fantasies of killing are actually very common among psychoanalysts. It's like sort of the work that we do. Um, and talking about that kind of stuff in forensic psychiatry is also very common. I think it got flagged because it's around race. Hmm. That, that was my next question. I mean, you're a trained yeah. uh, expert. You're trained in psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. And when we think about psychoanalysis, I mean, we enter all kinds of spaces around violence, around sex, around all. I mean, what, what's in the yes. mind is boundless, right? But, but yeah. something different happened here. Were you shocked that in a context where you're around peers, around other people who sort of know the various precincts of the mind that you can travel to, were you surprised that you got this kind of response? Um, are you talking about the aftermath, or what? Which part are you talking about right the now? Is what happened over the past? Oh, week? actually, that, that that that's a great point, right? So, I guess the first yeah. question is because most of us only got to hear it; we didn't get to see it because the audio was leaked. Uh, first right. of all, what what was the response from the people in the in the room, and was that different right. than the response was... from people? I first of all, I'll, I I gotta say this. I think this brother's sure. doing a pretty damn good job. I gotta say that right now. He's pretty yeah. sick so far. All right, keep going. All right. Black news tonight. There you go. So for the people night. in the room, it was all it positive. Funny. It was something that I had never seen in a grand rounds before, which is all the people of color were speaking up and speaking up first. And something interesting also happened, which is a lot of the white people felt sort of emotionally safe enough to ask vulnerable questions, to put themselves out there. But it was an overwhelmingly positive response. I always think so. Wow. So the yeah. controversy comes afterward. And when, we're going to take a short break. We're going to come back. And I want to talk about the controversy after and why you think that's happening. Everybody stay with me. We'll be back with more of an exclusive BNT interview right after this. So she has a Welcome different back view. to Black News like Tonight. I'm still here with Dr. Aruna Kilinani as we talk exclusively about her content of her virtual talk, The Psychopathic Problem of the White Mind. Before we talk about the kind of consequences, there are... Of, of is that her speech. book? Wait, what was that? Some of the, the white mind about her content uh, of her virtual talk, the psychopathic problem of the white mind. That's her we talk name, about dog. the kind of consequences there mm -hmm. of, of your speech. I want to talk a little bit more about some of the things that you said in the speech that I thought were interesting and compelling. You said, "This is the cost of talking to white people, uh, the cost mm -hmm. of your own life as they suck you dry. There are no good apples out there. White people mm -hmm. make my blood boil." When you say there are no mm -hmm. good apples out there. Uh, yeah. what, do you, what do you, what kind of claim are you making? I'm talking about people have this idea that um, racism is something that if you're consciously racist or if you're a Klan member, and I'm sort of making the claim that racism is something that is unconscious and it is actually in everyone. And everyone uses these words systemic. They're like, you know, I, I, you, I'm, I know that racism is systemic. And yet individually, when you call them out, they'll, they'll be like, well, it's not me. You can't say that. And so there's a disconnect between use of the word systemic and saying that racism is everywhere, but the moment you point it out individually, there's sort of people disown their own violence and racism. Ooh. Would it be fair to say, yeah, based on your expertise, that white people oh. are psychopathic? I think, I, I think so, yeah. I mean, I think I'm that there's many lies that, and I had, didn't get to that part because what I delivered was only um, part of a first series of talks. But the way, the level of lying that white people do that has started since colonialism, we're just used to it. Hmm. Such what as every time you, sure, every time Ooh. that you, um, you, you steal a country, you loot, you say you've discovered something. I mean, this is, this, le this level of lie is actually part of history. We don't say that we killed all these people, we got rid of all the Native Americans. We say we discovered America. You no, know, I think that would you be a lot more You don't talk about the level of Can we death. pause that real quick? You don't quick? talk about the level. You know, I think in, in reality, we would respect our own country if they just kept it a buck and said exactly what the fuck they did. I mean... Not, not even apologize for it or anything, just realize that it, put that shit in history, like, you did this shit. And own it. Because you can't... We look like we always look at 
other people as bad because they're doing something. But in reality, this whole land is like exactly what she just said. It's just a hundred percent what she just said. I and I having, think we will respect that a lot more if they just own that shit. I was having a conversation with a <clears throat> hardcore Trump supporter um, this weekend in Indiana. Flags, five country, whatever they call it. And he was like, you probably didn't like Trump, did you? I was like, he wasn't my favorite person. And, you know, we had this little conversation. I was like, you know, the only reason why I didn't fuck with Trump was because he acted like his shit didn't stink. Now, I'm cool if you want to do back house, take back roads, whatever you want to do, cut some corners, want to be shady, fine with me. Just let it be known that's what you're doing. Don't try to flip the script and, and, oh, I know I'm doing this, but look what they're doing over here. Nah, just be like, yeah, that's what we're doing. End of conversation. And I I would have been cool with that. I would have been cool with that. I don't know. I don't know. I would have been cool with that. As long as you tell me, you know, this is this. And that's it. I'm cool. I would have been cool. I would have been more cool with him, I should say. If you just kept it a buck. Kept it a buck with me. But you didn't do it in an asshole way. Is that what you're saying? Even if you did it in an asshole way. If you just kept it a buck with me, I would have been more on his side than I was. That's all that I'm trying to make the point of. That's more little confused. You're saying you would be more on it? With you would have rocked with him more if he would have just told you what it was. If he had just kept it a buck, well, stop all the lying shit. Did he? Oh no, he did. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. Well, there's too much lying. Yeah, but what politician keep, that acts like their shit doesn't stink? I, I, and that's what I'm saying. I agree like, with that too. if they just keep it a buck, but nobody there'd keeps be a buck. so many less issues. Nobody keeps. I a feel. Buck. I feel. Bernie Sanders would have. I feel Bernie kept it a buck. Joe's trying. There's like one Bernie Sanders out of every thousands of politicians. And I get that. Mm-hmm. And that's the problem. That is Just keep it a bike. You know, like, it's wanna, not that hard. I just want to take the time out to say, you know, George Washington was 100% against the two-party system. Look it up. Be a history. But I'm going like, to leave that out for the people. George Washington was like, slaves. Like this lady yeah, right here. Look, Rob, stop. Look, hold on, bro. No, we got to stop this. It, we got to stop saying everybody's bad because of one thing. The problem is, is exactly that. There is always going, you're always going to be on one side of something. In reality, America has a real problem, and it's all, it's the separation thing. It's the real, it's the legitimate, if, whether it's classism, racism, whatever ism you want to throw into it, or Democrat, Republican, whatever thing you want to throw into it, that is not the problem. That is true. You could have a different set of opinions. And that was the past. I can't, like, I can't, I can't. I didn't live back then. I don't know what I would have been back then. So I can't, I can't. Okay, fair. Fair enough. Fair enough. Or a free man. Then they probably would have kidnapped you and made you a slave. That's not always what happened. That's have, you read, have you read 12 Years of Slave? It's a movie and a book. Did you watch the movie? It's possibly a true but it's it was a based off his know. uh it's based off his uh what do you call it diary, diary. okay thanks the slave not a reading right back then he, he was a a, so he was a free man he was a free man he was he was a really educated free man and they kidnapped him and said you're a slave and he and he was a slave for about 12 years of his life on mm-hmm. and like on bullshit until they you know, until his people kept down and found him wow so one of his like white friends was like, "Yo, he, this is a free man. What you got to get him as a slave, and got him I off the plantations." You, it was sad, you, bro. That shit's sad as I'm hell. A, I bet you when the whole Liberia thing happened, he was like, "Yeah, I'm out. I can't do this shit no more. I'm going back to Liberia." Mm-hmm. I bet I'll you bet. He was one of them. I would have. At that point, I would have. I would say if you don't want to watch the read the book, watch the movie. Yeah, the movie's pretty solid. I mean, like this lady's over here keeping a buck at Yale. Yeah, let's keep look how positive. Let's keep working. on going with this. Like if politicians, like if I pull up to the politician, and let's say I really wanted tomatoes to be illegal, and I was like, "Yo, can we make tomatoes illegal?" And he looked at me, he was like, "That's fucking stupid. What's wrong with you? Get out of my face!" I'd be like, "You know, it was kind of fucking stupid. I should ask for something better." Just keep what? Just buck with people. 
I'm trying to be funny, Rob. Oh my God, you can laugh. We're talking about racism. I thought you. I thought you were trying, thought to, you were trying to. I thought you were trying to make. I thought you. Were, I thought you had a really bad like metaphor for, for what a you were what? trying to say. No, I thought you just had like a really bad metaphor. I was confused. It is also. I was a bad like tomatoes. Metaphor. Where's this going? If I had tomatoes, whatever. Oh shit. Are so you ready see. to talk back around or something? You said what? Are you ready to get back into talking about racism? Yeah, let's do this. ...of what actually occurred. You wiped the, the slate clean, you sanitized the violence, and you actually got lost along the way. You're trying to go to India. And then you say you discovered something. And this level of, of discovery is everywhere. You've discovered vegetarianism. You know, you've discovered, you've discovered yoga. You've discovered everything is a discovery, and it's all actually stolen. Yeah, so what you're talking about is. at this point is a kind of macro level systemic structural kind of thing But you're mm -hmm. also trained to think about the psyche, which is about the individual at a certain level Absolutely. To what extent can we say that individual white people are psychopathic or unhealthy or out of their minds? I'm using this language for those who are watching I'm using this language based on what was in the speech and based on uh, other work that, that's been published uh, This isn't my necessarily my personal opinion. It's the analysis here. Do you think to what extent can we say that individual white people are this thing versus saying that there's a culture of theft, a culture of colonialism? And can we? And is there a useful distinction to be made between the two? I think that I think people, I think people, there is a useful distinction to be made. And on one level, yes, that's absolutely true. And and you know, it's it's different than than actual um, individual psychopathy, the way that people conceive of it. On another level, when we are thinking about individual responsibility and how it is that people change, I think that using the words um, systemic and there's a culture operate defensively to not actually let yourself go into your own unconscious and go into those dark places of what you're actually doing. So I'm actually talking about it sort of as a defensive structure, like not acknowledging that on an individual level, I think can operate as a defense. Mm. You say that we need to remember that directly talking to white people is a waste of time. It's useless, you say, mm -hmm. because they are at the wrong level of conversation. A addressing racism mm -hmm. assumes that white people can see and process what we're talking about. If white people are incapable of being engaged on race, and there's a structural yeah. dynamic that makes it somewhat impossible, or at least makes racism intractable, then are we in a place of hopelessness around racism? What, what are we to do? No, I was talking about a feeling, a feeling of futility, right? So I'm, I'm talking hmm. metaphorically about a feeling of futility, and the disconnect that I'm talking about is that white people actually, it, they have a different conscious experience of themselves rather than, than what they're actually doing. So my entire first series is what is the disconnect between their identity, how they see themselves, and what they're actually doing? What is the disconnect between their actions and how they view themselves? So I'm saying the reason they can't get it at this moment in time and what the first series is, is what is white identity? How do they view themselves that is actually very different from their actions? So sort of naming that problem first so that we can actually move forward and talk about race. Sometimes we say things and we, hurt, we do harm with our words, we upset people, and we regret it. And then there are times mm -hmm. where we have to say, at least I believe, that just because white people are mad doesn't mean we did anything wrong, right? Uh, right. that we shouldn't infantilize white people, we shouldn't censor white people all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. Which one of these are we dealing with in the case of your lecture at Yale? Is this a situation where you feel like you did some things that you could do differently or that you did harm that was unintended? Or is this a case where white people are upset because they're being named and outed and, 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 and subjected to scrutiny? So I think the way that I framed the lecture was I sort of said that what is happening in this space is I'm giving you since conversation around race is always hard, I'm inviting you into a room where we talk about you. And this is sort of a special invitation to first see how we view you, because that might be very different than your conscious experience of yourself. So it's sort of an invitation into sort of a sacred space to see how it is that white people are actually viewed. So mm -hmm. if you were able to give the speech, or if you give the speech again, uh, would you use the same example? Would you would you appeal to the same uh, fantasy metaphor, uh, and, or would you do something different? Well, it's it, you have to keep in mind the audience, right? So the audience that I spoke to are psychiatrists and mental health workers, and I'm talking about psychoanalytic stuff. And if they can't go there, 
into those dark places, then I'm not sure like how we're going to be able to move forward. I do think that if it's an if it's a different audience, I probably wouldn't have used those metaphors. Um, mm. And you know, I, I would cater it to who the audience is and what I feel like they're able to tolerate. But people in our profession are actually used to sitting with very dark feelings. It's our job to metabolize negative feelings. It's our job to make connections between the conscious and the unconscious. That is what we do. We, in our practices, we learn, we teach people how to tolerate those very dark places in their life that they normally can't actually go. And that's actually where we need to go in order to move forward on race. So I'm speaking to a group of highly trained individuals, uh, medical professionals that are trained in doing this kind of thing and understand the importance of going into negative feelings, because if you can't actually tolerate your negative feelings, um, they're gonna come out in actions and they'll actually harm yourself and you'll harm someone else as well. Are they bad? So for that Since audience, this audio I has been it. leaked. <laughs> Since that? this audio was leaked, you have been, uh, since this audio was leaked, you've been a target of the right. You've been on every conservative dartboard. Um, yep. What's life been like for you? Uh, it wasn't fun. <laughs> Definitely wasn't fun. It's been really hard because, like I said, that this talk was for a certain group of people. And imagine that the group of people, like I said, that I, this talk was for people who want to understand and are ready to hear about their own violence. That is how I framed it. Now, and I think of it in the sort of like the same way I think about psychotherapy. People come into psychotherapy and they come into psychoanalysis who, who are ready. They're ready to actually reflect. They don't want to keep saying the, the problem is outside of me, it's the world, it's my boyfriend, it's my child, it's this. They, they know that they need to do the inner work. Now imagine that the talk suddenly got leaked to the very same population of people that aren't ready to do the work. And, and they actually don't think that there's a problem. So if you no, aren't no, ready to do the work and you don't think there's a problem, what's gonna happen? You're the problem. Yeah. It would be like leave me exactly. going around you the world will be like, you need to do a second. You, you become the problem. I mean, that's exactly the point, yeah. right? Is that they have decided right. that there is a problem, but it's you because any type of any type of race talk is the problem. And so anyone who mentions right. race or names race becomes the problem. And there's a way that your speech gave them a very convenient out. Doctor, doc, doc, doctor, we have to go. But um, thank mm -hmm. you so much for sharing your, your, your video. The reason why I laughed is because when you went www.inspire.com